Hello, my name is Timothy, and this is Martyrs for Christ. In this video entitled The Great Commission, we're going to take a look at the final instructions of Jesus to his disciples. We're going to begin by looking at the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, Mark, chapter 16, verses 11 through 20, Luke, chapter 24, verses 33 through 53. Now, these instructions from Jesus are specifically meant for the apostles, but I believe that they apply to everyone that is a disciple of Jesus Christ, even us today. So let's begin by reading Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now that we've read through the scriptures, let me give you a summary of the Great Commission in the book of Matthew. Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. I think that makes it pretty clear cut that if you're a disciple of Jesus, you need to go forth and teach others about Jesus. What specifically should we teach? Let's jump down to verse 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So what we need to do as disciples of Christ is to read through the four Gospels, learn the teachings of Jesus, learn his commandments, learn his prophecies, and just take good notes about how he was conducting himself in his business. And we should emulate Jesus, and we should share this information with others. So that's the first part of the Great Commission. The second part in Matthew is telling us to, in verse 19 again, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So if you are going to perform water baptisms, I think you should do it in the way that Jesus commands. And that is to do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I know that there are Christians that only baptize in the name of Jesus, but Matthew 28 verse 19 says to do it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, as an aside, I use the term the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit interchangeably. They are synonymous titles for the third person of the Godhead. The Godhead, I talked about the Trinity in, the last, in my last lecture. So I recommend watching that. But in summary, we have God the Father. We have God the Son, also referred to as the Word. God the Son is Jesus. And we have the Holy Spirit. And when, if you're going to perform a baptism, I believe you should reference all three when you're doing so. Now, let's jump over to the book of Mark. Now, let's read Mark chapter 16, verses 11 through 20. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them, as they walked, and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him, after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 
And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now that we've finished reading through chapter 16, let me give you a summary of the Great Commission as it's presented in the book of Mark. Verse 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this is once again Jesus telling his disciples to go teach the gospel to everyone. I think it's really interesting that the word creature is used and not just something like person. So I do want to elaborate on that point. So let's look at verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So, verse 17 says, In my name shall they cast out devils. So, if you're preaching the gospel to someone, and you're introducing them to Jesus, and explaining how they can be saved, and hopefully converting them to Christianity, to becoming a follower of Jesus, some of these people are not going to be receptive immediately. They might have something on the inside torturing them and trying to make them argumentative or just try to get them to create space between you and the person that you're trying to save. In that case, in some cases, people are just, let me just be blunt, they may be possessed by demons. And Jesus is telling us in verse 17 that his disciples shall cast out devils. If you read through the four Gospels, especially in the book of Matthew, you see numerous examples of Jesus casting out unclean spirits from people, usually because they're sick or because they're um, lunatics or just um, suffering in some way. Jesus casts out the devils and they are able to become whole. And I, I believe it's our job as disciples of Christ to emulate our master, who is Jesus, our, our teacher. The student should follow in the footsteps of the teacher and perform the same feats. So if you're preaching the gospel to someone, you're not going to just be talking to the person. You're going to be talking to probably demonic spirits inside of the person. So you need to cast them out. So that might be one way to interpret what it means when it says in verse 15, and preach the gospel to every creature. So you might be talking to a person, but you might also be talking to a spirit inside of a person and then commanding them to come out of the person. That's just perhaps one interpretation. We can expand upon this in the future video when we go into Mark in more detail in the future series. So let's move forward. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The term believeth, I believe that that means that you need to believe in Jesus, not just once. You need to continuously believe in Jesus. You need to maintain your belief in Jesus to be saved. I don't believe that that's will work. I don't believe you can just say like a sinner's prayer one time and then be saved. I think you need to continue from that moment forward in your walk with Christ and be saved. That, is, that to me is not a works-based salvation. Once you obtain knowledge, it stays in your brain. It's, you're not working to maintain the knowledge. Once you learn 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's, it's there. You're not going to unlearn it by saying, okay, from now on, 2 plus 2 equals 5. No, you, you got the knowledge and you've maintained it, and it's, it's just there. Once you've learned about Jesus, you need to maintain it in your heart and accept it, that he is your Savior. That's a long debate. I will probably make a video about once saved, always saved, and just what it means to be saved in the future. But I believe you need to maintain your belief. Believe if in this context is giving you, a, the tense is telling you that it's something that 
is ongoing. It's not some. It's not he that believed at one point in the past shall be saved. It's he that continues to believe shall be saved. But that's just my interpretation of that scripture. You will ultimately need to read the Bible for yourself and come to your own conclusions. But when you read the Bible, pray before you read, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in your reading and to help you to glean the knowledge that you need. Because this is really important. You don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to just um, take this too lightly. And verse 17 is also really interesting. We talked about casting out demons. That's something that Christians should continue to do. But also in verse 17, it talks about they shall speak with new tongues. I know that there are a lot of people that criticize um, Christians that speak in tongues. I don't believe that that's a fair thing to do. There are multiple gifts of the Spirit. I will talk about them in a future video. But speaking in tongues is just one. There's also... um, other things like prophesying and having visions and dreams and being able to interpret the tongues that you speak so i i think people should really be careful about criticizing other people that speak in tongues i i I think that that's something that's really dangerous that you see a lot of christians doing on youtube and saying and and they just or just not giving a fair uh, assessment of the situation, I believe. If someone is honestly and genuinely filled with the Holy Spirit and they're speaking in tongues like the apostles did in the book of Acts, we, so we see that there's an example in the Bible of this happening. People that say that doesn't happen today, I don't think that they're correct on that matter. But let's move forward. And they shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, well, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So, a lot of people aren't going to cross paths with serpents on a regular basis, or probably even at all in their life, if they live in a city, certain cities anyways. So, I think we can interpret this more broadly just to say that if danger comes your way, Jesus can protect you and help you to be steered around danger. So you might be driving down a highway and a drunk driver is making a beeline right for you in his car. But Jesus can protect you and get you out of that situation, make you aware and cause you to hit your brakes or to swerve out of the way. So, And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So there are people out there that don't believe that healing miraculous healings happen today i beg to differ on that matter i definitely believe that miracles still happen and that we as christians should pray for each other and we should pray for the sick and pray for healing ultimately we should pray for god's will to be done when it comes to our prayers for others so that's part of the great commission we need to spread the message about about jesus and about salvation Explained that Jesus is God and he's our savior and he came to earth to live as a man and he died for us. He took his, he took our sins upon himself when he was on the cross so that everyone that believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we need to share the good news and we also need to go forth and um, emulate Jesus as best we can. So pray for others, cast out devils, pray for the sick and trust in God for your um, protection. Okay, let's move forward to the book of Luke. Let's look in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 33 through 53. I'm mostly giving you so many verses in Luke just for the context. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and have appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them and breaking of bread. 
And as he thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are a witness of these things. And behold, I send a promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Now that we've read through the scriptures in Luke chapter 24, let me give you my interpretation of the Great Commission as it's presented in the book of Luke. Let's look at verse 47. These are Jesus' words, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is really interesting. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. So, verse 47 is telling all of the disciples of Jesus to go forth and preach repentance, remission of sins. So this is going to be kind of um, a difficult scripture for some people to follow because a lot of people teach that if you're a Christian, you can do whatever you want because you're saved and your sins are forgiven so you can continue in your sins. But Jesus is saying right here in verse 47 that we should be preaching repentance, which means to recognize that you are engaging in sin, to recognize that you are a sinner, and to ask for God to help you to overcome your sins. Remission of sins means to get rid of them. Repentance means to become aware of them and to regret it and ask God to help you get rid of them. And ultimately to do your best to separate yourself from a sinful lifestyle. Repentance and remission of sin also revolves around asking God to forgive you for your sins. And being forgiven by God for your sins. And this, was, and this is what we're supposed to preach in Jesus' name to all the nations. We aren't just supposed to preach that you're going to be saved by Jesus. But we should also preach to people to repent of their sins. And to give them up. So that's a difficult thing for people to digest, I'm aware. But nevertheless, we are humans. We all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. And here's something I want to say. It doesn't matter if you listen to different preachers like on YouTube or on TV. Or if you go to a church. And someone that you know that's a Christian makes mistakes. And then you want to say, well, all of these Christians that I've seen in real life or on TV or on the internet, they all make mistakes. And I'm not impressed by Christians. So, you know what? Christianity is false because of that. That's not the right attitude to have about this. Ultimately, Jesus is our role model. If you're a Christian... The only person you need to look up to is Jesus. That's your role model. That's the standard. Not another preacher, not another Christian, not your parents, not your grandparents or anybody else. 
Jesus is the standard. Jesus doesn't commit sins. He lived a perfect lifestyle as a human being. So that's the standard we have to, that's the standard we should want to raise ourselves to, not just, um, and we can't just give up on Christianity just because other Christians might hurt you along the way. Yes, you can find horror stories if you watch the news and learn about some bad things that happen in different churches, but none of that in any way precludes you from the need to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. So ultimately, you have to invite the Holy Spirit to live in your heart. You have to let the Holy Spirit be your guide. You need to learn about the teachings of Jesus. And you need to emulate Jesus for yourself. You can't just rely on what other Christians are doing. Even if you see other Christians like drinking beer and doing disruptive things and destructive things to their bodies, you know, that, that's, that's not your role model. Jesus is your role model. And ultimately, you have to stand by the words in your Bible. I have a King James version of the Bible right here. And that's the, that's the uh, version I suggest everyone start with. Read it for yourself. Take notes. If it's difficult to read through the first time, you'll have to read it again. It's just the way it is. You'll have to read this multiple times to really get to really get it. It also helps to listen to audio Bibles, but if you download an audio Bible, you can find some for free on the internet. Yeah, I have one from Amazon that was completely free. Uh, this King James version of the Bible. So you can find audio Bibles. You can find online Bibles like BibleHub.com, Bible Gateway, and other places like that. So you need to read it for yourself. You need to learn what Jesus is teaching us, and you need to um, let it just soak into your heart and let that be your guide. So this is Timothy with Martyrs for Christ. I would like to thank you for watching this video, and I will see you in the future.